Welcome to Digging Deeper and our continued study of covenants in the Bible. Hello, I'm John Miltner, and I'm filling in today for Pastor Bob. To review, we have been looking at covenants in the Bible and how they help to reveal the ongoing plan of God for mankind. It's important to remember that God's love for his people is a covenantal love. God's covenants with important figures in Scripture tend to provide a pathway through the Old and New Testament, ultimately resulting in the new covenant of Jesus Christ. Please keep in mind that a covenant is a personal and formal relationship between two or more people and focuses on kindness, loyalty, and helpfulness between the two involved parties. Today, we will focus on the covenant between Jacob and his uncle Laban. Remember that Jacob is the father of Joseph, and Jacob's sons and grandsons are the beginning of the 12 tribes of Israel. In this covenant between Jacob and Laban, God protects and blesses Jacob through his experience of dealing with greed, selfishness, and ultimately danger to himself and his family. As we start, we find Jacob running for his life. He had tricked Esau, his brother, into exchanging his birthright for some stew, which would have given Esau a double portion of the inheritance. And if that wasn't enough, he literally stole his father Isaac's blessing by wearing his older brother's clothes, plying Isaac with alcohol, and lying outright to his blind father. Incidentally, Jacob's name means usurper, and he truly lived up to his name. Now Esau had sworn vengeance, and Jacob is running for his life. When he got to a place that later would be called Bethel, something remarkable happened. He had a dream in which God spoke to him. Now let's read Genesis 28, verses 13 to 22. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and your descendants. Also, your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east, to the north and to the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Then Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put at his head, set it up as a pillar, and poured poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of the city had been Lutz before. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me, and keep me in this way that I am going, and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on, so that I can come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I set as a pillar, shall be God's house, and of all that you gave me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Jacob made a vow to God. In fact, he is the only patriarch to ever do so. He would worship the Lord as his God in exchange for God's promise of protection and blessing. Since that time in Bethel, it can be argued that Jacob became a changed man. However, he got a taste of his own medicine when he met his uncle Laban. Because Jacob was his nephew, Laban allowed Jacob to live there and married Rachel in exchange for seven years of labor. As a side note, at this time in history, Some slaves were able to buy their freedom by working for seven years for their master. I think that speaks volumes about Laban's attitude towards Jacob. However, things were not as they seem. When the seven years were up, Laban switched the intended bride to Leah, the oldest daughter. Jacob did get Rachel a little bit later, but he had to work an additional seven years in return. Now, it might seem that Jacob's life was just going in circles at this time and that God had forgotten him. Jacob is realizing that staying with Laban is not such a great deal. He has two wives, a bunch of children, and no money. But through his work and relationship to God, he has made Laban exceedingly wealthy, and Laban knows it. God has blessed Laban richly because of Jacob and the covenant that he made with God. As Christians, 
This shouldn't surprise us. Frequently, others are blessed in our immediate circle because of our relationship with Jesus Christ, even if they aren't believers. How often have we touched others and provided palpable benefits even to non-believers that we might know because of the love and obedience that we have for Christ? Likewise, Laban was aware of the advantages of having Jacob around and wanted to keep him there even if he wouldn't admit why. To make a long story short, Jacob and Laban reached an agreement where Jacob would take possession of all the speckled and spotted sheep and goats, and the ones that are without markings would go to Laban. Laban must have thought Jacob was a real sucker, because spotted and speckled animals are a rarity, and he thought that Jacob would never do well enough to leave and would depend on him forever. Needless to say, as time went on, God richly blessed Jacob, and his holdings greatly multiplied against all odds, and he became very wealthy. Laban, unfortunately, didn't do as well with his flocks. He ended up with the weak and the feeble sheep and goats that didn't breed and multiply that well. As God continued to bless and prosper Jacob, the covenant between God and Jacob at Bethel was honored by the Lord. Laban's fortunes declined, while Jacob became rich in spite of Laban's tricks and maneuvering. But sometimes God has to move things along a little faster so his will can be done. Remember that covenants mark time between important events, which we will see next. Laban's sons had started to grumble because they weren't doing as well as Jacob. And Jacob saw the countenance of Laban, and indeed it was not as favorable to him as before. What an understatement. Laban and his sons thought they were being robbed. Then the Lord said to Jacob, It's time to leave and return to your own country. God promised that he would continue to be with him. Thus Jacob, his wives, his children, and all their flocks and possessions made a run for it while Laban was away shearing sheep. Laban didn't find out until three days after they left. He and his brother, brethren took off in pursuit after them with the intent of possibly harming Jacob and taking back the flocks to restore his own wealth. But once again, God was faithful to Jacob. He came to Laban in a dream and warned him not to speak evil to Jacob or to harm him. When the two of them finally met, Laban was more upset that Jacob had left suddenly with his daughters and grandchildren without saying goodbye. Jacob also deprived Laban of being able to send them off with a joyous celebration party. Jacob unleashed a torrent of pent-up anger and frustration at Laban and recounted the ways that he had made Laban rich and how Jacob had suffered by the many ways Laban had tried to cheat him over the years. Jacob also said that God had seen Jacob's affliction and had protected him from financial ruin from Laban. He also knew that God had rebuked Laban in a dream on his behalf. Laban had nothing to say. He knew what he owed Jacob. Now, let's read Genesis 31, 44 to 55. This will be Laban speaking. Now, therefore, come, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. Then Jacob said to his brethren, gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap. And they ate there on the heap. Laban called it Gijar Sahudatha, and Jacob called it Galid. And Laban said, This heap is a witness between you and me this day. Therefore its name was called Galid. Also Mizpan, because he said, May the Lord watch between you and me when we are absent from one from another. If you afflict my daughters, or if you take other wives besides my daughters, Although no man is with us, see, God is witness between you and me. Then Laban said to Jacob, Here is this heap, and here is this pillar which I have placed between you and me. This heap is a witness, and this pillar is a witness, that I will not pass beyond this heap to you, and you will not pass beyond this heap and this pillar to me for harm. The God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, and the God of their father judge between us. And Jacob swore by the God of his father Isaac. Then Jacob offered a sacrifice on the mountain and called his brethren to eat bread. 
And they ate bread and stayed all night on the mountain. And early in the morning, Laban arose, kissed his sons and daughters, and blessed them. And then Laban departed and returned to his place. This covenant would bring peace and a separation between Israelite and Aramean branches of the same clan. The building of a sacred pillar and a heap of stones, along with calling for witnesses and a ceremonial meal, were important parts of this process. This was followed by the expression of covenant terms, the calling on the deities that would oversee the covenant, and the concluding ceremonial meal. This was the ancient Near Eastern custom for making covenants at the time. The pillar and the pile of stones were a witness to the covenant. The names literally mean heap of witness and Mizpah means watch. The agreement reached was that both parties would not pass by the boundary of the heap to do harm and that Jacob would not mistreat Laban's daughters. The story of Jacob and Laban brings to light the fact that selfish interests not only harm our relationship with God, but it also brings division of family. Fortunately, the covenant that Jacob made at Bethel with God ensured the presence and protection of God, along with multiple blessings, even in a hostile environment. When Laban tried to take advantage of Jacob and even cheat him, God turned it into blessings, both personal and financial. Through God's kindness and mercy to Jacob, along with his long-standing loyalty, he was able to move to the future plan of establishing one of the youngest sons of Jacob, a man by the name of Joseph, to lead the Israelites into the next phase of their history. And once again, the timeline moves forward. Pastor Bob will return next week. If this Digging Deeper has been helpful to you, please share it with a friend. Thank you.